Hey everybody, my name is Cameron Gita, and welcome to CES 2020 from Velodyne. Um, I've had a little history with Velodyne. I actually used to work with Velodyne, and I've since transitioned to a company called Autonomous Stuff. And our business is all about helping people de deploy autonomous systems um, and obviously using uh, Velodyne technology. Um, we've grown very quickly over the past couple years. We're now owned by a company called Hexagon, and I'll kind of walk you through the story of autonomous stuff and the synergies of Velodyne. Um, so obviously, there's all these amazing vehicles around us at this show, and as you can tell, we're trying to revolutionize the transportation systems. Um, there's, the cities are too congested. <clears throat> we're thinking of novel ways to kind of move people around. And our vision as a company is to help accelerate that and even get to the point where we're actually deploying our own technologies um, in autonomous transportation, autonomous mining, autonomous agriculture, really kind of cross-pollinating a lot of the technologies that come out of automotive into other, tech, other uh, areas of manufacturing. So autonomous stuff started in 2010 in a little town called Morton, Illinois. Um, it was just kind of happenstance that we started there. We were one of the first companies that as a private individual, you could come to us and buy an automotive grade product like radar, mobile eye cameras, and Veldine LiDAR. We are at our core a distributor, then an integrator, then a technology provider. <clears throat> and we've kind of just hung on the coattails of the industry addressing needs as we've evolved with startups, with big tier ones, and, and even OEMs. Since 2010, we've, we've grown threefold almost every year. We're now a globally recognized brand with, with offices pretty much all over the world. So if you kind of look at the perception of autonomous driving in a timeline here, um, back in 2004, the DARPA challenge, which was kind of the fomenting moment of, of Velodyne technology, um, people weren't even talking about autonomous cars. This, this was a far thing that, that even up until 2009 when we were watching the little Google Dragonfly vehicles driving around Mountain View, it still seemed like an unattainable thing way, way out in the future. Um, and then since our advent in 2010, we've maybe delivered nearly 600 research vehicles Many of those are actually being used as autonomous taxis today and, and being used on campuses, delivering people autonomously. So, and I think Cruise kind of capped it in 2016 there with the first kind of unicorn acquisition of an, a company really focused on autonomy. And today, well, even in 2020, there's thousands of vehicles out there. This is happening, and it isn't just happening on the road, it's happening in factories. Um, and it's happening in a lot of different kind of captured areas like mines and, and farms. So this customer base kind of gives you a feeling for the diversity of, of what we're dealing with. So you have companies like Neo that make vehicles, uh, Baidu of course with the Apollo software that's giving everybody the opportunity to de deploy an autonomous system via open source software. Um, Baidu is up to version 5.5 of that now and that's an entire stack of software to help you drive autonomously using Velodyne sensors and computers and cameras. Um, of course, Pony AI is an autonomous taxi company. They're now valued at almost a billion dollars. Um, and then even big OEMs, Volkswagen, Honda, and others, which are uh, <clears throat> all players in our business and all players in the autonomous world we're delving into. And of course, in China, um, companies like Jingqi, Plus AI, um, there are already um, <clears throat> autonomous taxis in Guangzhou. So China's a little bit ahead of us there, um, and we're certainly looking to catch up very quickly. Within the autonomous stuff ecosystem, we rely very heavily on, the, on ROS, that's the robotic operating system. Um, there's another company over here called Apex AI who's busy migrating ROS to ROS 2.0, which will be a real-time operating system, and it'll work a lot, lot better, a lot safer in autonomous systems. Um, we work with companies like Hitachi and Clarion in the technology side. Another open source provider is AutoWare. AutoWare comes out of Japan. It's another full stack of autonomous driving software that's open source, um, kind of rivaling Apollo, but a little more research grade. NXP and NVIDIA provide compute for us. And if you've kind of been following NVIDIA, they've 
in lockstep, made better GPUs. We rely heavily on GPUs when we're running AutoWare or uh, Baidu software. So these are kind of what our cars look like and who's using them. Um, AutoX up there in the top started out doing cars. AutoX is very much focused on food delivery today. Um, of course, Baidu with Apollo has really promoted the Validine sensor. You'll see that that's the old HDL64 on the roof. Um, and all these others, SF Motors has changed to SoCon. Um, and too simple, another, they weren't a billion dollar company a couple years ago, they are now another unicorn, similar to Pony. Um, too simple does mainly trucking. So even though we don't feel like this is all happening, all these companies are out there making money, getting investments. Um, too simple is delivering US mail today. So autonomously in a semi truck, pretty amazing stuff. So this is kind of where we're distributed. We obviously started in the central <coughs> US in Morton, Illinois. It just happens to be right next to Caterpillar where we actually draw a lot of engineering expertise from because Caterpillar has been doing autonomous you know, tractors and mines for many, many years. Um, I work out of the Silicon Valley office um, and out of there we do a lot of integration and kind of support hundreds of customers who have our vehicles in and around the Silicon Valley. And it's kind of been the hotbed of uh, autonomous development to date with a lot of big OEMs moving there and establishing research markets. Um, we recently opened an office in Detroit and with our acquisition, um, he with Hexagon acquiring us, we now have a bigger headquarters in Calgary, Canada. Of course, offices in Germany, China, um, and partners, Magnica, a distributor in Japan. So pretty broad footprint with the time we've been alive. So what do we do? Um, the first thing is products. We are a distributor of Velodyne, and we don't only distribute and sell these, we integrate them, we fuse their data with other sensors, like cameras, and we make them really work on a car so you can make a map with the sensor or you can detect something with the sensor, um, and, and really making getting the most power you can out of it. Um, and that's wrapped up in a lot of our services, which come down to consulting. If you want to deploy a car, we can help you to select what sensor do I need? What vehicle do I need? What compute do I need? How do I keep that stuff cool? How do I power it? Um, these are all skills that we've developed over the past couple of years deploying real autonomous cars. And incidentally, we've, we're putting commercial grade uh, technologies often, not the Velodyne, but computers and stuff. So it's, it's tricky getting an HDMI connector to hang on on a Jeep off road um, and dealing with a lot of those issues. On the software side, um, we can provide full integration of AutoWare, full integration of Baidu, uh, Apollo. So that means we can deliver a vehicle that's running a software stack that can make maps, drive autonomously the day you receive it. Um, this will greatly increase the speed at which you can go to, go to market with a certain technology um, and obviously cut down a lot of the time in development. Um, platforms, we provide full vehicles, like I said. So you can get a car with the software, with the sensors ready to go. Um, and, the, and the list of platforms we're dealing with just gets longer and longer every day. Um, and the last piece is data intelligence. Of course, none of this happens without massive amounts of data. Um, the, the, the Alpha Prime today produces you know, gigabytes a second. So we also deal with capturing massive amounts of data very quickly in the trunk of a car. Um, today, these are rates exceeding 20 terabytes an hour that we have to deal with capturing that in the car, getting that off the car in some graceful way, and really building up data lakes um, with partners like Quantum so we can kind of make, make use of all this data, developing algorithms and AI. So like I said, it's not just automotive. Um, we work a ton with universities because they're producing the engineers. They're gonna really realize this in, in, in the future. Uh, maritime is big. Maritime is a wonderful application for Velodyne LiDAR. If you're trying to map a harbor, if you're using it for anti-collision, um, it's a, a great technology there. Of course, military has its space in this. Um, robotics. Uh, any robot that's moving around, whether it's delivering your food on the sidewalk or in a factory, nothing's better than using a LiDAR to you map an area that you're going to be in and also use the same sensor to kind of um, detect objects as you're moving through that map. Uh, mining is a big piece for us. Um, you can deploy autonomous systems in a mine because they're geofenced, it's somewhat controlled, and there's big gains in removing a person from an application like that. You can operate 24-7 in bad weather. Uh, we're doing a lot of work in Australia right now in the mines. 
Um, agriculture is a little bit of a newer one. Agriculture, of course, has tons of precision, but what we're doing adding LiDAR to that is adding better plant identification capabilities, adding better safety detractors so they're not running into each other, running into people. And, um, and of course, the startup world is where these companies like Pony and Too Simple came from. When, when we first started working with them, they were four or five people. Um, four or five years later, they're billion dollar companies. It's pretty incredible. Um, aerospace as well. Um, a couple years ago, I worked with SpaceX to put an ultra puck on the um, landing barge that the Falcon rockets land on. So the rocket lands on this barge in the middle of the ocean, which is incredible in and of itself. But they don't know exactly where the rocket is on the barge. The alpha puck tells us where it is, and then this other robot goes and grabs the bottom of the rocket because you're still in the middle of the ocean. And then they drive it back to the Air Force Base. So um, that ultra puck is certainly helping the space race. <clears throat> so what are the applications we can do with these things? Of course, autonomous driving is the big one. Um, one that people don't think about as much as 3D mapping. Autonomous driving is very dependent on 3D maps. There's nothing better for making a 3D map than a Velodyne LiDAR. So a lot of the companies like here and others are out driving millions of miles with LiDAR on their roof, making very high quality HD maps that then we use the same sensor to localize within that map that's already been created. So really lessens the load on GPS and it helps you get very accurate positioning on the road. Safety and security. It's great to use LiDAR to observe areas. It doesn't need light, it can look through the dark. Um, I can identify people with it. It's a great safety device as well. Um, in AI, we're developing a lot of algorithms that instead of using a camera to detect and identify something, we can do that now in LiDAR. So identifying cars and stop signs and people and bicycles in LiDAR is a novel technology and it just really augments what we can do with a camera. Um, <clears throat> in remote control and monitoring, those are more of our technologies. We do a lot of what's called teleoperation. Um, so if I'm in an autonomous car, it it's always gives you a warm fuzzy to know there's actually somebody looking through the camera of that car and who can actually take over if they needed to. This isn't like a continuous operation thing, but teleoperation gives you a, a human in the loop. Um, in case something unexpected goes on, the human can actually take over and, and operate the vehicle. So kind of a broad thing, of, and of course, tracking and classification, just like with cameras, we can do that with LiDAR. These are the kind of vehicles that we basically make autonomous. Um, and the list is constantly growing. We started out with the Lincoln MKZ, um, and we're typically looking for a vehicle that already has some existing ADAS functionality. Um, the MKZ starting in 2015 has active lane keeping. That means there's a motor in the steering column. It has bywire braking, um, and it even has a push button shifter. I hadn't seen a push button shifter since muscle cars in the 60s, but it came back with a Lincoln. And the beauty of that is I can shift gears with a CAN command. I don't have to physically move something. So Ford was clearly that um, when they designed it. And these maybe had six or 700 of them. The Lincoln is going away uh, next year, and we're kind of backfilling that with the Lexus. The Lexus is just a bigger platform. It's a little more accommodating for people, um, as is the Chrysler Pacifica. So it's a constant growing list. We're adding more vans. And the other big development is in the semi-trucks. Uh, two years ago, PACCAR came to us at Autonomous Stuff and said, hey, we need a safe interface for researchers dealing with semi-trucks. So we collaborate with PACCAR, ZF, and Bendix to offer a safe, functionally safe interface for semi-trucks that also utilizes ZF steering and Bendix brakes. Um, we can do other cars. If you brought us a vehicle, uh, whether it's a tractor, whether it's a combine, or a sports car, we could probably make it autonomous if, if the business case made sense, um, including buses and other kind of transport vehicles. So this is the basic makeup of what's going to be in an autonomous car. This is our Lexus. Um, if you're ever in Silicon Valley, you can swing by our office. I can take for you a ride in this exact car. Um, this Lexus runs AutoWare which is an, uh, the autonomous self-driving stack out of tier four Japan. And just to kind of run you through the stuff that's already there, you've already got ultrasonics on your vehicle probably. You might have radar on your car today for your adaptive cruise control. We might add a few more radar, we might add a few more ultrasonics. Um, of course, LiDAR, we're putting LiDAR on the roof. We've got two HDL32s on the roof. Um, we'll often put LiDAR around the corners of the vehicle to detect people. 
course, if you're going to drive this thing autonomously and you're not there looking, you have to make sure that you can see a person anywhere they're walking around the vehicle, even if it's a little child. Um, LiDAR makes that really easy. And then getting into the, the kind of back end of the car, we've got all the power for these computers. We're putting computers in here that we're kind of training with. So we will often use 2,000 watt or more, you know, size computers. So that brings up the needs to put a shore power there. You can plug this thing into the wall and run your computer when you're in, in, parked in a garage or if you're unloading data from it. Um, and we also utilize GPS technology. So if you're familiar with uh, Novatel, our, our actually sister company now, um, most of these vehicles have what's called a, a tactical grade GPS. That's a dual antenna GPS with an IMU. Um, the two antennas of the GPS, I'll usually have one kind of on one corner of the rack, one on the opposite corner of the rack. The benefit of that is I have two antennas that tell me the heading of the vehicle even when it's parked. If I just had a singular antenna, I'd have to drive around in some shape to actually get some heading from my GPS. The other benefit of having an IMU attached to that GPS is that if I don't have GPS signal, the IMU tells me, am I moving, have I stopped, what's going on as far as accelerations are doing um, in that situation. And that's what's called um, RTK GPS, giving you, I don't know, two centimeters, three centimeters of accuracy pretty much anywhere on Earth. Um, and then the last thing is a camera. We're obviously typically fusing camera data with LiDAR data to give us you know, a multimodal sensing detection to tell us I'm detecting a person in LiDAR, I'm detecting a person in radar, I'm detecting a person with a camera, that data fusion gives me a very good probability of what I'm actually seeing is real. And, and that's the essence of what's in an autonomous car today. This is gonna continue and all you're gonna see is further miniaturization of the technologies, lower cost of the technologies, higher volume, and, um, and, and just more intelligence on the edge. So. But this operates like a car will in the future, but we're just gonna shrink down all the sensors, shrink down the power consumption, um, and increase the safety, so. <clears throat> and then the silicon is a huge piece of this, right? I mean, all of these players are developing the decision-making, the inference engines that have to make the decisions on what the car is gonna do. So with this much investment going into this, you know this is a, a real thing by now. Um, NVIDIA with their GPU technology, of course, we're analyzing all sorts of images. GPUs are fantastic for that, and NVIDIA is certainly benefiting from it. Um, QNX is a little more on the communication side. Another interesting technology we utilize in autonomous driving is DSRC or 5G. We're using radios to either tell us how close is the car next to me, or that's V to V or what's happening 10 miles down the road, that's V to X. I can communicate with other infrastructure to say there's a traffic jam, there's ice, there's something going on that I might need to know about if I'm not driving. Um, other companies like this, you know, Mobileye and uh, Hitachi making cameras. They make already edge computing cameras that are detecting lanes, detecting people, really just augmenting that safety equation for autonomous driving. So pretty exciting stuff. And of course, the research at universities will be then deployed a couple years down the road as the newest technologies. We spend a lot of time working with these, these research institutes because we know that's where the next spark of innovation will come from. So of course, University of Waterloo was one of the first vehicles we ever delivered. Um, out on the West Coast, UC Berkeley and their, their program, uh, Berkeley Path. Um, Texas A&M has one of our trucks. So pretty awesome to see these, these uh, new entrants and then most of the engineers we work with at a, at a university end up at a startup or a tier one as soon as they leave. So this is the entire range of products that we distribute and integrate. And as you can see, it's kind of like a, a expanded list of what we see on that vehicle. But when we say 3D, that essentially means LiDAR or LiDAR mapping. Um, it's really the only 3D product we deal with. Actuation, we sell motors, cannon actuators for making your steering wheel turn, actuating the brakes. Um, and these are devices or motors that actually talk in CAN, so they're gonna operate with the regular system that's already in the vehicle. By wire controls, we develop our own safety critical by wire controller called PacMod. And what that is, is the computer that is the interface between your inference, I made a decision, and the steering wheel. So it's, and it's a core piece of autonomous technology because this device, the BioR control, has to decide how do I move the steering wheel, 
did I move the steering wheel um, and, and was it executed safely? So BioWire Control is a piece that a lot of people don't think about, but that interface to the vehicle is, is, a, is a core piece of safety. Um, and we also tune these things to where an interface or a, a command given to it feels as if a human is deploying it. So we will teach the actuator to behave like a human so you don't feel like a robot's driving the car. Um, of course, compute and data acquisition. And even things you might not think about, enclosures. Like, we use a lot of machine vision cameras. I can't just put those out in the environment on their own. We develop a lot of custom waterproof enclosures, either to keep them clean, to keep them dry, to keep them from breaking, to keep them from getting stolen. Um, we obviously sell kits and platforms, software. I mean, it's a huge list of stuff, and it's constantly growing. The other thing we do at Autonomous Stuff is really keep our eye out for new technologies, maybe have a new software module that we can distribute. You've got sensors we can distribute. Um, we find a lot of homes for new technology that are just entering the autonomous world. And the Velodyne lineup. So when I started at Velodyne quite a few years ago, we had the HDL64 and the 32E. Um, the Puck, the VLP16 had just come out. And the expansion of the line really from there has been pretty staggering. Um, and the HDL64 is, is almost like a museum piece with what it's accomplished. But it's continued to grow. The Velodome is a really interesting one for us, kind of moving from very, very long range to shorter range sensing. And of course, the solid state Velaray is kind of the holy grail that we've all been waiting for, right? It's sitting right there. This really gives us automotive grade uh, robustness and can hopefully drive the cost down to where it can be consumed in very high, high volume. Um, and essentially, if you guys aren't really familiar with this, they're all using time of multimodal time of flight. I'm shooting at a bunch of lasers. The number of lasers varies obviously from 64 up to 128 in these cases. And you know, the benefit of a good LiDAR is point density. How many points can I put on an object at, given a, at a given distance? Um, and of course, the 128, it almost looks like a 3D photo. The point density is so high. And really another cool thing you can do with LiDAR is multiple returns. I'm shooting these pulses of lasers out. I can actually receive multiple returns. So maybe I'm flying a drone over the forest with my LiDAR shining down on it. And I can image the tops of the trees with the first return. The second return, I can actually see where the ground is. And then when I process all that data, I can just remove the trees. And this technology has actually helped people in Belize discover um, different kind of... Uh, Mayan temples and stuff because you can actually scan an area and then remove the vegetation. So a lot of stuff outside of uh, the car world that you can do with these, these sensors. And then this is the kind of technology that we put in a car specifically to drive it, in this case with AutoWare. I need a, set, I need a computer with a GPU. Um, I need one radar, just forward facing, a camera. Um, Velodyne, either a 128 or a 32 typically for highway speeds, and uh, GPS. So this kit allows you to do low speed urban driving with open source software with a car that you can actuate. It's not a lot of stuff, as you can see. And it's really leveraging very proven technologies that already exist. <clears throat> and then the services we do, of course, engineering and integration is big. Most of the companies we work with don't own tools. Um, I would venture to say that my shop in Silicon Valley is the only autonomous car shop that has tools. Um, so most of our customers that have vehicles are, you know, breaking them, overheating stuff. They're constantly coming back in for us to fix things. Uh, it's become a big part of our business. The training piece, you know, we're a safety authority. So if you're going to deploy an autonomous system, we'll often consult on how do you check this vehicle to make sure it's safe to deploy? What are you going to do during deployment to make sure it's being maintained? Um, and just kind of helping startups who are so task saturated, you know, get into the minutia of how to deploy a safe system. Software is becoming a bigger part of our business. Uh, we're developing things like lane keeping software, adaptive cruise control software. It's kind of starting to compete a little bit with the, soft, the startups we might work with. But in many cases, we would just produce a, the core bones of a software module, then someone else can kind of put special sauce around it. Um, and of course, consulting is all about that. And then all the different things we might deal with in integration. Um, of course, putting a sensor on a vehicle isn't as simple as that. You've got to know how high it is. You're not occluding the beams. You don't want to have rocks flying into it. 
Cables and connectors. This is probably the hardest part in our business is because making sure everything stays connected while it's bouncing around before it's really been hardened and, and productized. Um, cooling has been a big thing as we're using big giant computers. Typically we're doing water cooling today with computers, so it's really helped a ton with noise as well. You don't want to have a huge fan buzzing around in your ears, you're giving people rides. Um, and just a kind of a huge list of what we do as far as integration and services. This is our newer facility in central Illinois and our founder and CEO, Bobby Hambrick. Um, and now with where Hexagon, Bobby is the chief autonomy officer at Hexagon Incorporated. Um, and this is a 42 bay um, shop we have in Morton, Illinois. And we can, you know, kind of the scale of vehicles we can turn around. These are mainly MKZs. And that's a little party we had at the, at the opening day. So pretty neat to see all this grew. Because when I started with autonomous stuff only three years ago, it, w it was basically like a garage. Um, and it's, you know, six, eight times the size of that now. So pretty exciting times. And it continues to grow. And then the software side, this is really the core stuff that we're developing to help customers, you know, get there quicker. We've got lane keeping algorithms. We've got object processing. We've got LiDAR object processing we can add to your Velodyne. Um, we have full shuttle automation software that can either do a GPS path and drive through it or using AutoWare make a LiDAR map and drive through it. And then the core piece is said about making sure it doesn't feel like a robot is driving a car using speed and steering control. These are special algorithms we develop around the braking and steering to make sure that it's smooth and it doesn't make people feel uncomfortable. And I have to say, after doing thousands of autonomous demos for people, the best feedback I get from somebody is like, well, that was boring. And it should be boring. It should just feel like a normal car. It's not going to be some exciting roller coaster ride unless you really want it to be. And then LiDAR object processing. This is when we take Velodyne data and either tell us where the ground is, tell us where the walls are. Um, and it's really doing deeper analysis of raw Velodyne data that we can really pull the, the nuggets of information we need out of it. And using this sort of software helps us just lessen the load of inference on a computer. And of course, the data intelligence piece. Um, this is, was a surprise to many people, I think. The first 50 or 60 cars we sold you know, we put a normal computer in it, a little bit of storage, a couple terabytes. Most of those people came back to us a couple of months later and said, we're making so much data, what, what do we do with all this stuff? So we've developed special hard drives and SSD technologies that A, can ingest massive amounts of data very quickly. This is like six to 10 gigabytes per second of data we're, we're ingesting. Um, and then basically store that data, maybe help people organize the data, either annotating the data, creating maps with that data. So there's a lot of different things. Huge value proposition in just owning this data. And to kind of give a reference for that, if you bought an HD map of the state of California, every road in California, that's probably going to cost you about $30 million today to get it fully annotated with all your stop signs and stuff. So, And then, of course, you're using this data to make better algorithms um, and, and really to make things safer by training them more deeply. And then this is that kind of workflow of how we acquire data, classify and label the data, privatize the data. Of course, we can't go around filming people's faces and using those in data sets. Um, so that's a big piece of the classification and labeling. Um, you're going to use that data, obviously create algorithms, uh, you, however you're going to do that using deep learning, and then deploy that. And it's a continuous loop of training to really make a system better and safe. And that's it. So if anybody has any questions, I could field them quickly. Um, and if not, you guys have a wonderful CES.